O God, whose Son Jesus is the Good Shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name, and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. On this fourth Sunday after Easter, typically known as Good Shepherd Sunday, I was particularly drawn to the Acts reading this morning. And I'm just going to read a little bit of it for you, and then just I'll explain why it seemed to be so relevant. And those who were baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon everyone because of the many wonders and signs that were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, As they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This chapter it's been a special one to me my whole life, and the, the tradition that I grew up in, Acts chapter 2, was something that I heard often, as it seemed to set the template for what this early Christian community was like. We have the very first Christian sermon. We have the very first baptismal service. And then at the end, we get this idyllic picture of the first Christian community. And the reason I think that this passage is spoken to me this week is because I'm reminded in this picture of the idyllic Christian community of these practices that seem to, that we have lost as we've all been safer at home. This idea that these people heard this sermon and they were baptized and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit and then they started to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all Christians, from these first ones to the ones living in this day, and my guess is to all Christians yet to come, they will take this model as the way to be the Christian community. But it seems like there are at least a few things in this list that are very hard to do right now. The Apostles' Teaching, of course. We have books and books and books. We have podcasts. We've got ways that we can engage and read the scriptures ourselves because many of us have Bibles in our homes. And if we don't have a Bible in your home, I tell you there are Bibles on the internet. And if you don't have a Bible in your home and you don't have access to the internet, we will get a Bible into your home. And so you can still engage that. That one seems pretty easy. But the others in this list, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers, and prayers not just individual, but prayers as a community, these all seem so hard to do. And a lot of us, not just people that wear black shirts and white collars, have been trying to figure out the best ways to do these other three in the midst of a time when we felt like we had these all ripped away. But we're discovering our view was too small. That in many ways, these can still be done. We find great fellowship three days a week in a very small group that gathers for morning prayer. And if you ask any of them, I think they would tell you the same. It has been great fellowship. We have found ways as a diocese to worship and pray together in a very strange way, using tools that we thought were just for posting cat videos and updates about 
how our grandchildren were doing. We have found ways that really are meaningful that we never thought had meant any meaning at all. Well, this breaking of the bread one, that one does seem difficult. And as our time of isolation continues, this seems to be the one that wears down on many folks. Because we've taken this to mean communion only. And I'm not here to dispute that the writer of Acts probably did intend, in many ways, the gathering of the group of followers of Jesus together to bless bread and bless wine and share it as though Christ was present with them, is what they had intended. But I think, just like we thought that the, the, we could only have fellowship when we could be in person and we could just pray together when we could be in person, just as the way our thinking was too small there, our thinking is too small if we say that the writer of Acts only had in mind a ceremony presided over by someone with training wearing a robe and a stole on Sunday morning. That that breaking of bread that they devoted themselves to, we can still devote ourselves to, wherever we might be, whether we're with our families, whether there's even bread and wine necessarily. But we can sit down and we can bless the meal that we are about to have, remembering and inviting the Lord Jesus Christ to be in our presence. And we're carrying on the tradition as well. We are breaking bread. And like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, who were not having communion with Jesus when they recognized him merely eating, we can find that we can do this too. This time of pandemic is not a time of no church or lesser church. It has really been a time for us to reevaluate what we think church needs and rediscover our own ability to devote ourselves to the things that are most important about being church. We don't need someone else or some other organization to do it for us. We can dig in to the apostles' teaching. We can have fellowship with one another. We can break bread in ways that we recognize the risen Christ in our midst. And we can pray together. None of that has been inhibited by anything around us in the world, nor could it ever be. It is only inhibited by our own limitations that we put on ourselves and the thinking that we have when we say, I must have this to do that. And the truth is, we don't. We have God's Spirit, and we can do it as well. I mean, the dirty secret of this passage is they have none of the things that we call essential. This community, they're doing this in homes. They have no buildings. They've not ordained anybody. They haven't had fancy ceremonies or learned lots of fancy songs to do any of this, and they're already doing it at the very beginning. We just need to have a bigger field of view of how we can do these things and devote ourselves to them to continue to be God's people in the world. So that template was something that's been important to me my whole life. Anytime I've evaluated a Christian community to be in, I have made sure that they tick those four boxes. Apostles teaching, is it there? Fellowship, is it there? Breaking of bread, and I mean communion, and what I just described, and prayers. And if they can't tick those boxes, that doesn't feel right to me. 
But this passage has taken on a new importance for me as well. Because as you read it, you hear of this wonderful community where everything, everybody had things in common. They sell, sold things to um, make sure that everybody had everything that they needed. Those are also things that we've been doing in this pandemic time, trying to figure out how to care for one another from afar. And we also see that um, they were praising God and had goodwill of all the people. How could it be more perfect than that? Well, it is almost a little too perfect. And as I grew and I read this passage and I came to realize this is the last scene of Act 1 in the books of the Acts of the Apostles where the Spirit has come upon the people. Everything is as perfect as it could be at this moment. But I didn't take this view to the Bible that I often take to other media that I watch from time to time, which is if you're watching a movie or a television show or reading a book, and finally, very early on in that story, a person has one of the best things that could ever happen to them happen to them, if their life seems perfect, we all know what that means is coming in this movie. Things are going to get hard. They're going to go real bad for somebody real soon, often. That sinking feeling that you get in the pit of your stomach when you see that two persons who have been falling in love about halfway through the middle of a film, they express their undying love for one another. And the filmmaker makes the scene fade to black. You know that the next part of the story that happens when it fades up, something is going to challenge that love that they have. It might not be something that will destroy it forever, but it could be. And I believe that the writer of the book of Acts is doing that with this scene as well. The scene isn't here just to give us a picture of what we should strive for. It is a warning that when things are perfect, we stop looking for how we need to continue to grow. Because immediately after this, Peter and John are going to find themselves on trial. We're then going to get a story about some people that exploit the idyllic nature of this community. They are going to try to gain favor and power in the community by being the best, the most charitable. They're going to sell lots of stuff so that people think good things about them. And it's going to end very badly for them. And then the story after that, we're going to discover that this idyllic community that they have formed, this picture of perfection, is only for some of them and not for all of them. And we have to have the very first church council to figure out how we are going to deal with the fact that we have already in this perfect community, us and them. It's because their view of the community wasn't expansive enough. And the last phrase in here foreshadows the trouble that's to come when it says they were, the Lord was adding to their number daily those that were being saved. It's actually the growth that was the main thing that threatened them in their perfection. And I also think on this Good Shepherd Sunday, when we think about who God is calling as the shepherd, who Jesus as the gate is letting in, we don't need to be threatened by who is being added, as the text says, by the Lord. We need to know that this 
having all things in common, it extends to everyone who gets at it. Selling of possessions to take care of others, that pertains to all those that are added as well. That this here is not here to tease us, to make us want to form that community. It is there to remind us, and some of us have found this time to time when we think we've got the perfect church family. That there's a threat to it. And that threat is God's grace. And we are going to be challenged at each turn to figure out how not to want our ideal and perfect community to maintain it as hard as possible when there are others growing around it. And that's going to be the challenge of the whole book of Acts. This community has to grow. God means for it to grow. But every time it grows, it is a challenge. It is a time to reevaluate and reimagine whether or not our view of God is expansive enough or if we put limitations on God.